so I'm here to tell you that the way we've been thinking about psychology has been all wrong. But it's not your fault. See, psychology started out with a really solid foundation, like other disciplines. When I ask you to think about a discipline like cardiology, you probably think of this. And when I ask you to think about a discipline, podiatry, you probably think of this. But if you're like the thousands of psychology students that I've taught over the last two decades, then when I say psychology, you probably think of this. Now this is problematic that we don't think of this, and it's even more problematic that we don't think of this. Because early in psychology's history, the discipline was founded on understanding or thinking about the physiological basis of behavior and its evolutionary root causes. One of the founding fathers of psychology, Wilhelm Wundt, who wrote the first textbook in psychology entitled The Principles of Physiological Psychology, discussed throughout that text the role of instinct and the nervous system on instinct. And even Charles Darwin, in his book, The Origin of Species, discussed the evolution of behavior and psychology being based upon the principles of natural selection and sexual selection. So what went wrong? Well, early in the 20th century, a discipline that is now known as radical behaviorism took the helm of psychology and it held psychology in a theoretical stranglehold for the better part of 60 to 70 years. Radical behaviorism was founded upon three basic principles. The first principle was that all organisms, including humans, were born as blank slates. So this would suggest that, according to radical behaviorists, you're all able to be programmed in the same way that we could program a robot or a computer by your environment and your culture alone and that no behavior was heritable or inherited from your parents. The second basic principle of radical behaviorism was that any response could be trained by any stimulus. And this would be to suggest that I ought to be able to train you to be afraid of the chair or beanbag that you're sitting in as easily as it would be for me to train you to be afraid of a spider or a snake. But decades of research on phobias has demonstrated that while it's extremely simple to train you all and other animals like monkeys to be afraid of a spider, to develop arachnophobia, or to develop ophidiophobia, an irrational fear of snakes, it's so challenging and difficult and uncommon to train an organism to fear a chair that it doesn't bear neither a scientific nor diagnostic name. The third basic principle of radical behaviorism that has led us off course in psychology was that biology was unimportant. Behaviorism was founded on the idea that if we couldn't see it, we shouldn't study it. And we can't see the brain in the early 20th century. So in psychology, it's time for a change. And there's been some developments from the 1950s up to the present that I think are key developments changing the way that we all should start thinking about psychology. And the benefits, I think, are profound, not only for the human condition, but for helping people with mental illness. The first major development happened in the 1950s. And many of you may be able to relate to this phenomenon that I'm gonna discuss. You may have gone to a restaurant, had a meal, maybe had a beverage, maybe one too many beverages, that later or subsequently made you ill. And what you learned unconsciously, whether it was associated with the food you ate or some other kind of illness, was that that food should be avoided like the plague. That process is known as conditioned taste aversion, and it was discovered in rodents in 1950 by a researcher known as John Garcia. And what Garcia did was, he, he was studying the effects of radiation on nausea, and so he paired the nausea with different stimuli. A bright light, 
a loud sound or a new food that his rats had never eaten before. And what he was able to demonstrate that is while in no trials he could train the rat to associate a loud boom of sound or a, loud, or a bright light with the feeling of nausea, in as little as one trial he could train his rats to be fear, afraid of that food and avoid it like the plague for the rest of their lives and they won't forget that learning process. Now this is important because it goes against the ideas of radical behaviorism and the standard social way of thinking about things because it suggests that this is a behavioral characteristic that's inherited. The animal does not have to learn by trial and error. If he keeps eating the red berries, he gets sick and dies. So you have to learn very quickly. The second major development that I think turned the ship in the right direction for psychology was the advent of human brain mapping. And in fact, the discovery of human brain mapping is a phenomenon that is, that is amazing to talk about. So in 1991, three independent research groups showed up at a conference in San Francisco on medical imaging, and each talked about this new technology we oftentimes refer to now as functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. This new technology that allows us to peer into the brain of living awake human beings. And up until that point, in order to study the brain effects of human behavior, you either had to wait for the patient to die or you had to euthanize the patient. And in my experience, undergraduate students who volunteer for research frown upon the latter. <laughs> now, human brain mapping is something that I'm, I'm very involved in. And I'll give you two examples from my own research program. For a long time in the history of psychology and the history of philosophy, researchers and thinkers have been asking the question, what is the human self? What constitutes the self? In my own discipline, we define the self as our capacity to think about who we are today, who we were in the past, and then who we're in the future or, or who we are going to be when we grow up. Well, who are you gonna be when you grow up, right? And that capacity for thinking about yourself across time has been linked by my research group and some other research groups to your capacity to empathize with other people's states of mind. So as an example, if uh, one of you were to experience embarrassment today, I would be able to use my experience with embarrassment in the past to model your experience of embarrassment and I can then empathize with you. And what my group has been able to show is that the same part of the brain has evolved to allow humans and probably some great apes to engage in self-reflective processing and then use that self-reflection to think about the mental states of other humans or other critters that they come into contact with. Now, this may sound trivial. It may sound trivial to study the self. We think about the self, and if you were to go out and say, oh, I heard this lecture about the self, people would, what's that? Except when you take into consideration that both autism and schizophrenia are both marked by deficiencies in this self-other empathic processing, and it's the same part of the brain that's dysfunctional in both conditions. Let me give you another example. In a long history of research on neuroscience in animals, we've associated a part of the brain known as the amygdala with fear and aggression. That is, if you went into a lab and you cracked open the skull of a rat or a monkey and you stimulated the amygdala, it would be fearful and then usually it would bite out against you or it would aggress against you. And while the amygdala does very similar things in humans, it's also been shown recently that the amygdala in humans has been associated with higher complex social cognitions. And the one that my research group has, has been involved in researching is the capacity for our amygdala to generate what we generally refer to as a first impression. So you might look around the room here. I'm looking around the room here and I see some really awesome people. And um, you might say, um, this person up here appears to be pretty trustworthy. While maybe uh, the gentleman in the back looks a little bit creepy. Uh, you may make some other socially complex, important decisions. Like you might say like, um, this person in the front is rather hot, while um, that person's not. And those are important impressions that we make automatically in a matter of milliseconds that predicts how we're going to interact with other humans. 
Again, it sounds trivial. Why is he talking about the neuroscience of attractiveness? Because in every mental illness known to man, the amygdala is dysfunctional. Depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism. I could keep going. Let me tell you about one last fantastic development that has just happened in the last two years and I'm super excited about it. University of, Researcher, University of Virginia researchers have discovered a new biological system. So you may recall back to eighth grade when you learned about the circulatory system and the respiratory system and the skeletal system. Well, those textbooks are going to have to be updated to include this yet unnamed new biological system. This new biological system integrates and synthesizes communication between our central nervous system and our gut-based immune system. So whereas we used to think that they were separate and there was some kind of chemical message between the two, we now know that the lymphatic nervous system is integrated into the brain and the central nervous system. So it's not named yet. So should we name it today? All right, so by round of applause, I'm going to give you option A, and I'm going to give you option B, okay? Okay, so option A, by round of applause, we're going to call it the neurolymphatic system. Okay, those are my science geeks. Over here, we're going to call it the gut check system. I like it. So what the researchers at the University of Virginia were able to do is to show that this gut check system, our gut check system, right, is intimately involved in the changes of social behaviors. They took a population of mice in their laboratory and they altered the genetic strain of gut bacteria. And they demonstrated that that gut bacteria signaled a different message to the nervous system through this, uh, to the nervous system through this new gut check system. And it produced symptomatology in the mice that was non-social, that approximated autistic-like behaviors in so far as we can have an autistic mouse. And then what they demonstrated was that if they cured that gut bacteria, all of the non-social behavior that looked like autism remissed. The mice got better. This is a brand new system. It's gonna change the course of the way we think about psychology as a biological discipline. It's gonna change the way we think about psychology as a treatment or applied discipline. So why do I give you these three examples? that I think are changing the way that we see psychology. Well, because if we keep on the path that we're going, on this social science model, that the nervous system and the evolutionary underpinnings of that nervous system are not important, I feel like we're missing the boat. We're missing the target. We're not answering big questions. So I feel like with this new science of the mind, something that I've dubbed evolutionary cognitive neuroscience, I feel like we're poised to open up a new era for better understanding the human condition and for better enhancing human mental wellness. Thank you. <laughs>